<laughs> so thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm very excited to be uh, here at Nerd Night. I'm going to tell you about point grade conjecture or how I learned to stop worrying and lock my bike. Is this obvious? <laughs> so the uh, story begins uh, around 1904. French mathematician Henri Poincaré asked a question that stumps the mathematics world for about 100 years. 2003, my bike was stolen. <laughs> Coincidence? <laughs> well, perhaps. Uh, this is something that we're going to talk about. Um, Poincaré's question, in somewhat technical terms, uh, is every simply connected, closed, three-dimensional manifold homeomorphic to the three-dimensional sphere? So I'm going to come back to this and hopefully explain most of the words in the statement. Uh, 2003, the same year that my bike was stolen, Perlman announces his, uh, his proof of the result. Um, he answers Poincaré's question, and he builds on work of mathematicians over the previous several decades, uh, and there's like intrigue surrounding uh, the proof, and he's this like weird guy. <laughs> so uh, he gets his name in the New York Times, among other things, and uh, mathematicians go nuts. So, uh, and, and, and nuts in like a positive way. <laughs> mathematicians are crazy, uh, but this is, this is a really exciting moment. So they can be forgiven. The answer is yes. So uh, Poincaré's conjecture uh, holds. So what does all this mean? What does it have to say about the quote-unquote shape of the universe? And what does it have to do with locking your bike? So here is a different picture of Perlman. I actually uh, <laughs> chose not the one that, that Rick showed you. This one makes him look a little bit more normal. Uh, <laughs> it is a little bit older. Here's a picture of Poincaré. And uh, in, in the abstract, I know some people have read it, I did promise uh, a little bit of a love story. Uh, this is a guy named Paul. So I don't know if I'm the only one who can see the resemblance. Paul was the guy that I bought uh, the bike that replaced the stolen bike from in 2003. And we <laughs> fell for each other and dated for several years in our 20s. And we continue to be friends. So he's actually using the middle picture as uh, his current Facebook profile photo. <laughs> and I was like, dude, send me a picture of yourself for real. And he sent me the one, the one on the right, <laughs> which was very nice of him. OK, so that's it for the love story. Back to math. Uh, <laughs> so here's a picture of Leonard Euler. I have no idea whether or not he's crazy. He's a mathematician in the 1700s, uh, Swiss mathematician. And he is commonly credited with being the father of topology, which is the field in math that I work in, and the realm in which the, point, the statement of the Poincaré conjecture finds itself. Uh, on the right, we have a cube. Um, so you might know, or you might be able to count, a cube has eight vertices. 12 edges and six faces. So uh, the vertices are the, do I have a, is, is this a, yes. <laughs> vertices, these zero dimensional pieces, edges, these one dimensional pieces, and faces, these squares, two dimensional. So for now I'm thinking about this as being sort of a hollow box that contains all of its sides and its top and bottom, but it's empty on the inside. Uh, so this is not a discovery of Euler. It didn't take until the 1700s for people to discover this. But one th thing that he did was he took this alternating sum, so that means plus, minus, plus. Eight vertices, eight minus 12 plus six, this is two. This is something that is now uh, known as the Euler characteristic of the cube, it's two. Okay, so where can we go from here? Uh, well, this Euler characteristic doesn't change if we change the shape of the cube. So I can deform it in this continuous way, I can stretch it, I can make it really, really big or really, really small, and it doesn't change the number of vertices, edges, or cubes, and so the Euler characteristic doesn't change. So the Euler characteristic of these cube-like things is also two. Uh, likewise, I can make it super wiggly, and it doesn't change the Euler characteristic. Something that is uh, per perhaps a bit less obvious is that I can decompose the faces. So here I am changing the number of faces, edges, uh, and vertices, but I'm not changing the Euler characteristic. This alternating sum is still two. Something's going on here. So uh, for some of you who may have missed that, uh, let me put this in terms a nerd can understand. <laughs> All right, so the Euler characteristic of cubes uh, are two. And a cube can mean anything that you can deform to be a cube or decompose to be a cube. So let me focus on the dodecahedron. 
the dodecahedron has 20 vertices, 30 edges, 12 faces. It's not a cube from that point of view. However, this alternating sum, the Euler characteristic still gives us two. So uh, <laughs> Rick stole my joke. <laughs> So here's something maybe a nerd can understand. <laughs> okay, so so th there's some property that the uh, cube and the dodecahedron are sharing, uh, but it's certainly not like the number of vertices, edges, and faces, because those are different for those two shapes. But this alternating sum, the Euler characteristic is still two. So uh, you could ask, well, maybe the Euler characteristic is always two. And I remember seeing this in high school and like completely missing the point. Uh, in high school, the answer was yes. You had this formula like V minus E plus F is two. I don't know if anyone else saw that. I'm from Canada, so maybe <laughs> we study it there. Uh, in any case, here's a donut. Uh, and what I'm going to do is find the Euler characteristic of, of the surface of this donut that topologists call a torus. And we saw with the cube that it, it doesn't matter how you decompose the surface. You're always going to get the same Euler characteristic. So I'm going to choose a decomposition that's easy for me. And even it might be hard to count uh, in this picture, but uh, as long as I got everything right, I've got four vertices, eight edges, and four faces. So the Euler characteristic is zero. Zero is not equal to two. So the high school answer was somehow wrong. But it was wrong in, uh, for the reason that we were like excluding uh, the Euler characteristic for shapes like this. So now that we have this, oh, wait, oh, shit. <laughs> wait, let me go back. <laughs> Let me put this in terms a nerd can understand. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I was like, don't screw up the jokes. <laughs> so, uh, so here we have uh, our, our, our famous donut lover and, uh, and a donut. The surface is called a torus. It has Euler characteristic zero, not two. So our three examples, the cube, the dodecahedron, and the torus, uh, and their Euler characteristics, we have two and zero here. Um, so what's going on here? There's something that the cube and the dodecahedron share with one another, but not with the torus. So there's some property that is invariant under deformation and uh, decomposition that they share. And this is the Euler characteristic. Um, so uh, I don't know if it's obvious to people, but, but because I qualify myself as a topologist, uh, I can see that these are both topologically spheres. This is the thing that they share. It doesn't matter about the number of vertices, edges, and faces. What matters is this topological type. You can deform both of those in some continuous way to spheres. And now the Euler characteristic is invariant under these continuous deformations. I should say continuous invertible deformations. I mean something precise by that. Um, so these guys, you can deform one to the other, but you can't deform a guy over here to the torus. And how do I know that? Because they have different Euler characteristics. So they're topologically different, and the Euler characteristic is telling us that, that you can't deform con in a continuous, invertible way one to the other. So this wouldn't be an intro topology talk if I didn't say the following thing. Um, many people might, might know this. The saying goes that a topologist is someone who can't tell the difference between a donut and a coffee cup. So there's, I mean, there's a reason for this. <laughs> They're topologically equivalent. So imagine that uh, both of these objects are made from something like infinitely stretchy, um, played over something. Uh, then like with your hands, you can actually deform one to the other in some continuous invertible way. Um, and I've actually done this with Play-Doh with students. It's like, I think it's fun. I guess they think it's probably pretty boring, but. Uh, so like, yeah, so like, what's going on here? Um, the coffee cup seems to have these two holes, one here and one here. But I'm a topologist, so I know that one of the holes is topologically insignificant. It's what keeps my coffee from spilling on me. This hole is just really a well. It doesn't go the whole way through. So it's topologically insignificant. The significant hole is coming from the handle. So in this continuous deformation, this handle here goes to the handle here. Is that something people have heard before? OK. If you take one thing away from this talk, this should be this. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so we have uh, shapes with Euler characteristic 2, shapes with Euler characteristic 0. 
Uh, my next example is going to be a shape of Euler characteristic negative 2. Does anyone have a guess for what's about to go up there? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's the most delicious two-hole donut you've ever seen. <laughs> Do you see why I like topology? <laughs> So we started with this, going from a sphere to a donut, we decreased Euler characteristic by two. Going from a one-hole donut to a two-hole donut, we decreased Euler characteristic by two. Now you ki can maybe imagine a whole class of examples, <laughs> uh, I don't have pictures of those, I'm sorry, uh, of, of donuts with uh, more holes and different Euler characteristics. And in fact, there's a linear relationship between the Euler characteristic and the number of handles. Uh, so effectively, Euler characteristic means number of handles. So there's a classical theorem in topology, the classification of surfaces, and um, it's, this is a very nice type of theorem in math. Um, so before I state it, maybe I can uh, tell you the type of theorem that I mean. So in math, uh, a lot of the time, you make some definition. I haven't given you a definition of surface, but I've given you a bunch of examples. Um, so you make some definition of the kind of thing that you want to study. and. Uh, and then you define what it means for two of those things to be equivalent. So you have a bunch of objects, and then you can sort them into uh, uh, the ones that are equivalent and the ones that are not. So imagine putting, like, now I'm talking about surfaces here and continuous deformations. So I can put all of the surfaces that are topologically equivalent, continuously deformable, into a box. Right? And I can sort all of my surfaces into all of these boxes. And, uh, and that tells me my... Uh, topological type of surfaces. I've got all this list, of this list of boxes. And now what I'd like to be able to do is somehow know what boxes I have. So like how many different kinds of surfaces can I have? So I can imagine in this example taking the Euler characteristic and labeling each of the boxes by the Euler characteristic of the surfaces inside. The surfaces inside of one box are all deformable to one another, so they all have the same Euler characteristic. So what the classification theorem says is I do this labeling of boxes and every box gets a unique label. So the uh, Euler characteristic is a robust enough invariant to tell the difference among surfaces of different topological type. So this is like a good kind of thing uh, that you might want in math. You've got all these different kinds of objects. How many are there? What's your list of objects? Uh, and you don't always get to have one of these classification theorems, but it's nice in surface topology that you actually have one. So what does this have to do with the Poincaré conjecture? So uh, on one of the first slides, I said that the Poincaré conjecture was a statement about uh, three-dimensional manifolds. And that's the classical version of the Poincaré conjecture. There's actually a Poincaré conjecture for all dimensions, at least two. And Dimension two, the, dimen the, the dimension two version of the Poincaré conjecture is a statement about surfaces, so it's a lot easier to state and draw pictures of and convince people of than the other ones. So here I've got uh, a torus and a sphere. So those are two examples of kinds of surfaces that we've talked about. And essentially the Poincaré conjecture says you can lasso a donut, but you can't lasso a ball. That's, that's really what the statement of the conjecture is in dimension two. Uh, now, we can make this a little bit more precise. Uh, what do I mean by lasso? I'm considering loops on the surface. So the way I picture these things are like uh, elastic bands, just like sitting on the surface, so sitting on the surface of the donut, sitting on the surface of the ball. And uh, the ball has this property that if I look at any loop on it, I can like uh, stretch and deform. Remember, this is topology, so this is allowed. Uh, I can stretch and deform the loop keeping it on the surface to be arbitrarily small. So using sophisticated technology, I have a, a movie <laughs> of, of uh, <laughs> the deformation of this loop on the sphere to become arbitrarily small. And that's what I mean by shrunk to a point. Um, but so notice that I've got this loop on the torus, and I can't do that to that loop. I can drag it around on the surface of the donut as much as I want. I can stretch it and shrink it, but I can't make it arbitrarily small. It's somehow fixed. I can't make it arbitrarily small without breaking it or breaking the surface. And breaking is not allowed. That's not a topological move. So, uh, so in this case, I can distinguish the sphere from the torus by this property, that every loop on the sphere can be shrunk to a point, and that there are loops on the torus that cannot be. So what the two-dimensional Poincaré conjecture says is that this property distinguishes spheres. 
sphere is topologically a sphere is the only surface that has this property we can sh shrink every loop to a point so in some sense this is like an unsatisfying theorem because you already know about the classification of surfaces using Euler characteristic if all your surfaces sorted into boxes and you know that you can uniquely label those boxes by the Euler characteristic okay, forget the Euler characteristic for a second um, think about instead this property of being uh, every loop is shrinkable so I can instead label the box by surfaces in this box satisfy the property that every loop is shrinkable and what the theorem says what the Poincaré conjecture says in dimension two is there is only one box that gets the label that yes every loop on the surface is shrinkable so if all you care about is spheres <laughs> then that's a pretty good theorem that you can detect spheres by this loop shrinking property so this is maybe the most technical slide so I said the classical Poincaré conjecture is about dimension three uh, and in dimension two this is I'm just restating the theorem that uh, every loop can be shrunk to a point that means you've got a, a sphere a two-dimensional sphere uh, a surface is something again I haven't given you a definition I've given you a bunch of examples a surface is something that's locally two-dimensional um, so a very nice example of a surface is the surface of the earth and I'm not thinking about anything like complicated like rivers and valleys and whatnot but like let's call it a globe uh, so locally this is two-dimensional what does that mean well so I just learned actually that the Greeks knew that the earth was round <laughs> I thought that like nobody for Christopher Columbus like even had that idea <laughs> but I was wrong <laughs> Uh, in any event, like anyone could have been forgiven for thinking that. Like, the Earth is really, really big, and you're stuck to it, right? And as far as I can tell, as far as I've ever seen, the Earth looks flat, right? It looks two-dimensional. I can go north, south, east, west, and same for everyone in the audience. So it wasn't till was it 1969 that we could actually get off the surface of <laughs> the Earth uh, and look back at it and be like, oh yeah, right, sphere. <laughs> So uh, three-dimensional manifolds are, are uh, generalizations of surfaces where I replace the word two-dimensional with the word three-dimensional. Um, so, uh, so here, it's really hard to like, draw a picture of a three-dimensional manifold. Like I have this picture of a part of the sphere, but really I'm drawing a picture of a two-dimensional thing in three-dimensional space. And if I were to try to draw a picture of a three-manifold, I might try to draw it in four-dimensional space. And I'm just not that smart. Um, so all I've got here is what it looks like locally. I can go up, down, left, right, backward, forward. Those are my three dimensions of movement. Um, so uh, there is a version of a three-dimensional sphere. So this, this sphere, the one that we know, the surface of the Earth, is a two-dimensional sphere sitting inside three-dimensional space. There's a version of a three-dimensional sphere sitting inside four-dimensional space. Um, and that's the... Um, that's the three-dimensional manifold that the Poincaré conjecture is detecting. So, oh, this is a, <laughs> I don't know any physics. Um, <laughs> but this, I put stars on this to make it look like this was a slide about physics. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, can, I, can, I can make this like heavy statement that the universe is a three-dimensional manifold. And again, like, I'm not saying space-time, I'm saying space. I don't know anything about quantum effects, like whatever. All I know is about like what I see. So from where I look, the universe that I live in looks pretty three-dimensional. I can go left, right, up, down, and the other one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, and I, I imagine that it's the same for you, and I imagine it's the same for aliens living wherever they live. Um, and so what that means that the, is that the universe is locally three-dimensional. So it's some three-dimensional manifold, and we're just too stupid to know which one. Like, we, it's really hard to get on a spaceship and leave the universe and look back at it like we did with the surface of the Earth. So what we have to do instead is, like, perform these, like, local calculations. And I think these are, there are people who actually work on this, and there's quite an extensive Wikipedia page on the shape of the universe. Um, so, like, because you're stupid and you're stuck inside of it, it's hard to perform the actual calculation. So let me propose a completely impractical experiment, <laughs> because I'm a mathematician and I can. Uh, Let's use the Poincaré conjecture to figure out if the shape of the universe is a three-dimensional sphere. So uh, what I propose is checking to see if you can send, if you've got a lasso, you're Wonder Woman, you can send your lasso to like any point in the universe. And just always check to see if it comes back. If it comes back, if you can shrink it, that means there are no non-trivial loops. By the Poincaré conjecture, that means 
that the universe is a three-dimensional sphere. That's all you need to do. So I don't know what's taking the physicists so long. <laughs> Okay, that's it for physics. I did want to mention that there is a really nice connection between um, the Poincaré conjecture over its history and uh, a bunch of people who have lived in these parts of the world. So all of these pictures, except for this guy, this is a painting, uh, but every other picture was taken in Berkeley. So uh, there are lots of people who I've not listed, and, and I probably even missed some who have connections with Berkeley, but who've worked in the Poincaré conjecture over time and so I said there is a, exists a Poincaré conjecture in all dimensions. So we call dimension five and higher, that's a high dimensional manifold. <laughs> five is a high number for topologists. Um, so all of these guys, uh, these guys were professors, this guy visited, this guy has a funny connection to Berkeley. He, uh, so the legend goes that he enrolled as an undergraduate at Berkeley, and then uh, this is like the late 60s, um, maybe as a first year student, <laughs> wrote a letter to a topologist at Princeton who then invited him to come speak, or to come talk about math in, in Princeton, and uh, he just stayed and got his PhD. So the legend is that he actually never got an undergrad degree. Um, so I'd say the, the guys in the top row I, I would call topologists. The guys in the bottom row are geometers. Um, and I have a little bit more to say about Bill Thurston on the next slide, but I thought I would also mention all of these guys are Fields medalists, which is as Rick said, basically the equivalent of a Nobel Prize. Um, so I think that's pretty cool. There's like all this, uh, all these like hardcore people working in this field. So Bill Thurston, my thesis advisor was a postdoc at Berkeley when uh, Thurston was a graduate student. And uh, ever since then, he's referred to him as the master. And my, like, my thesis advisor is like a famous rock star mathematician. He calls this guy the master. And this is one of the reasons. So. Uh, Perlman didn't really prove the Poincaré conjecture in dimension three. He proved Thurston's geometrization conjecture. So Thurston, the master, uh, came up with a, a, a conjecture in geometry, which is like harder, way harder than topology. That's why I study topology. Uh, but uh, it implied the Poincaré conjecture. So if Thurston's geometrization conjecture were true, that would mean that uh, Poincaré's 100-year-old conjecture were true. And that's what Perlman proved. That's why one of the reasons this proof is so hard. It's because it's a proof of a way harder thing. It's essentially a classification theorem for three manifolds, which is like crazy. Um, so I'm not going to give you a statement of the geometrization theorem. It's super cool. Uh, but this is one of my favorite pictures of Thurston right here. This is a fashion designer whose name I forget because I'm a mathematician and I don't know about that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but he, some of, one of them got in touch with the other one. He maybe heard wind of, of, of Thurston, and Thurston was totally on board for this collaborative project. There was a whole fashion line based on Thurston's geometrization conjecture. And uh, it, it's totally worth Googling. <laughs> it's really neat. Uh, so uh, I think that this, is a, this is a pretty cool thing about Thurston. Oh, right, okay, so... <laughs> So uh, this, this is my bike in 2003 in Toronto, and what I believe I locked it to. Uh, <laughs> this was after some drinking. <laughs> the obstruction to stealing this bike, I would say, is geometric, not topological. What I mean here is it depends on the sizes of things. It depends on how big this lock is and how big uh, the stop sign is. So remember, in topology, you can stretch something uh, as far as you want, as long as it's this continuous deformation, it's topologically the same thing. And so uh, you can stretch this lock to be as big as you want, and you can just lift it up over the top of the stop sign and steal the bike. Um, so like I said, uh, maybe this is what I actually did. Uh, and there is, of course, <laughs> no <laughs> obstruction <laughs> stealing this bike or the lock. So this is, this is somehow a better situation here. If you can find one of these posts that actually connects to the ground in these two places, uh, then you, you can have a topological obstruction to stealing the bike. Um, and I'm not making any claims that it's harder to make a mistake. It's just harder to steal the bike in this way when it's locked correctly. So um, I claim that there is a connection between this and uh, the point gray conjecture. So I'm going to imagine, remember, a three-manifold is something that is locally three-dimensional, like the universe. 
So I'm going to imagine the three-dimensional manifold that consists of everything outside what you see in the picture, the earth, the post, and the bike. So it looks like that. So this is my picture of my three-dimensional manifold. Uh, it's not a three-dimensional sphere. It's just not. Uh, and so what the Poincaré conjecture tells us is, since it's not a three-dimensional sphere, there exists a non-trivial loop. There exists a loop in this manifold that cannot be shrunk to a point. And, well, okay, there's an asterisk here, because actually this is, like, total BS. <laughs> 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 but uh, hopefully there, there's some topologists and geometers in the audience, right? <laughs> Call me out on it. Um, in any case, <laughs> um, <laughs> Planck rate conjecture doesn't actually apply to this three-dimensional manifold. Um, in any case, uh, I'm pretending like it does. And so, uh, so there's a loop that I can actually uh, exploit to lock the bike correctly. So uh, the upshot is uh, topological obstructions to stealing a bike are, in general, in my perspective, better than geometric obstructions. I don't really lock to stop signs that much anymore. Uh, the Planck rate conjecture guarantees kind of, that uh, topological obstructions actually exist. And so my advice to you is to find a post with lots of topology, lots of holes, uh, and use the topology to create a non-trivial loop to lock your bike. And then, of course, finally, actually lock your bike. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks very much. Uh, I do have two suggestions for further reading if you're interested. Uh, this is a really nice treatment um, of the history of the Poincaré conjecture. Uh, and this is uh, a little bit more technical, but a very nice introduction to the topology and geometry of three-dimensional manifolds. Um, Jeff Weeks is knowing, known for being like totally awesome, and this book is totally awesome. And I would say it's, it's quite accessible. Like if uh, you have a patient and interested high schooler, uh, he could read this book. Like you don't need a lot of background. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, so Kate will answer some questions, but I want to remind people in theater too, there are neighbors over there, I guess, uh, that Kate will be over there during break to answer your questions. If you have something die that's just burning and you're dying to get it on tape and you want it on the internet video, come up, come over here and ask, but uh, otherwise Kate will answer questions from theater one. Why can't she take the two-hole donut and just pull it back on itself so it's a one-hole donut? Ah, so that is, that's continuous, but it's not... It's not invertible. So what I mean is a continuous deformation, an invertible continuous deformation, should be one that when I like replay it backwards is also continuous. And so replaying that folding over backwards would involve breaking, and that's not that's not allowed. So yeah, so that's that's a good question. It's just not invertible. Up here, uh, I understand your bicycle was stolen in uh, Toronto. <laughs> and, uh, no, the current mayor of Toronto is <laughs> campaign to get rid of bicycles for downtown. Yeah, I think he took it. <laughs> <laughs> I have a suspicion he's not conformable in between his uh, cocaine snorting episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. uh, but uh, you know, if you uh, have a shape that you can't visualize, uh, how, uh, how do you manipulate it uh, uh, rigorously? I mean, do you, I guess you have to resort to some algebraic. Uh, uh, so the question is, if you have a shape that you can't visualize, uh, how do you manipulate it? Or basically, how, how do you even like treat it rigorously? Um, and so, uh, so one one thing that you can do is is call yourself a geometer, and then you have like equations. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and so that's where the algebra comes through, and. Uh, and uh, that's like that's one of the things to me that's hard about geometry. I'm actually like, really bad at equations, <laughs> but like I got a postdoc at Berkeley in math. <laughs> um, so from my point of view, uh, uh, there are ways of defining things, um, the sort of amount to using equations, and in topology, uh, we would have some representative like that, and then say like, oh yeah, anything that you can deform to that. Um, so, uh, so, so yeah, so sometimes showing explicitly, actually I do this to my students uh, when they're starting to learn topology because they're so uncomfortable with like how non-rigorous it seems. I'm like, draw a picture, it's an answer. Uh, and, like, undergrads at Berkeley don't like that. Uh, so I make them write, write a few easy examples down and they're so awful, <laughs> like they're so hard to do that they don't ask for it anymore. <laughs> but but uh, you should say like, um, you know that, uh, 
you always have the potential to write something down. It might just be hard. And, and algebraic topology, which is what I study, um, is sort of an exercise in uh, making those things easier. So like Euler characteristic, I can write down the number like two, uh, and that's completely rigorous. Um, and so we do things like that, attach more algebraic invariants to these spaces. Can I ask a follow-up question about the Euler characteristic? I'm yes. Way up here. Oh, hi. Hi. So the Euler characteristics you presented were integer value. Can you just, could, if somebody wrote down a number and it was like 1.35, could you build a shape that had that Euler characteristic? So that's not something I can do. Oh, sorry. Uh, can you uh, have a space with Euler characteristic that is not integer valued? Um, it's not something that I could do, and because of the definition of it, uh, where you take the number of uh, vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces, you'll always get an integer because all of those are actual numbers. But there are uh, generalizations of these things. Um, there are th generalizations of s the spaces that they refer to. Um, so, uh, so the easy answer is no, and the hard answer is yes. <laughs> So your shape with the Euler characteristic of negative two with the two holes in it, mm -hmm. uh, couldn't you put a loop around the center of it mm -hmm. and then shrink it around to form that loop and have it go to you know, a small loop and then a point? So this one that goes around this. Sorry, the question so is about around the center, like up and down. This one? No, 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 like. This one. No. Oh, that one. Ah, okay, yeah. Um, so this is the one, the one that goes around. Yeah. I mean, I could draw the you know, loop with you. <laughs> <laughs> did, I just, did I just get it right? No. Oh. <laughs> draw it. So, so if there were a loop right here. So it doesn't go around the back? Uh, it would go around the back of the... Ah, okay, okay, yeah, so this one. Yeah. Um, that one is actually... Uh, so the question is about the, the triviality or non-triviality of, of that loop. That one's actually non-trivial, but that's really hard to see. Okay. Um, and so, so in this way of like writing things down rigorously, we have ways of representing these things um, that are like effectively equations that show us that that's uh, non-trivial. But yeah, these, these things get pretty complicated pretty fast. Um, so, uh, so follow-up question: mm -hmm. What's the distinction between trivial and non-trivial loops? Uh, deformable to a point or not? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so that one is not deformable to a point, meaning that it's non-trivial. So, there's like a lot of shapes and things that we experience that we kind of relate this to, that we that we see and, and touch or something. So, uh, like this topology used solve practical problems, or is it mostly a campus ladder? I mean, you say getting your head swollen. Is topology practical? <laughs> well, I had a proposal about the shape of the universe. <laughs> I called it impractical. Um, in other words, is it connected? Could, do people then try to apply this to things that are connected? Yeah, actually, actually, there, yeah, actually, yeah. I, I have a reasonable answer to that question. So, is topology practical? Uh, the answer is yes. I'm not an expert, um, but there are some like really interesting things that are going on, and we're really lucky to have fantastic topologists at that other university on the other side of the bay. Um, <laughs> in the heart of Silicon Valley. Uh, one of the topologists there um, has, has got a startup. Uh, he's developed a whole field of uh, applied topology called persistent, hom persistent homology, which is effectively studying the topology of large data sets. And uh, they just got like a huge run of funding, and uh, I, don't know, it's, I don't know a lot about it, but it's like super cool. So that's like, that's, like vague, uh, but hopefully that's the answer you were looking for. <laughs>